Thank you so much, James. And I just want to echo the invite that James gave you to sign up for a life group. Guys, particularly if you don't have a group, the one that James mentioned there, the Wednesday group would be a great group for you to be a part of. I have not looked at the roster for that group, but even without looking at the roster, I can guarantee you this is not a group of guys that would claim to have it all together. This is not a group of lifelong Christians. This is just guys who want to grow, who want to uh, go deeper in their relationship with Jesus. So I would encourage you guys to sign up for that group or everyone else sign up for one of the other groups. But uh, this morning, we're going to dig into God's Word. Let me encourage you, if you've got your Bible or your Bible app, open up to Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 27. We have been going as much as we can, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through this book of Mark. And uh, the portion of Scripture we're going to be covering this morning, we've titled this Death and Taxes. And the reason we've called this Death and Taxes is because those are the two questions that people come to Jesus with in this part of Scripture. It was in 1789 that one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, said these words. He said, Our new constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable, but in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Death and taxes. That's what we're looking at this morning. We're just going to reverse the order. We're going to do taxes first and then death because that was the order of the two questions that people brought to Jesus. The first one was a question about taxes, and our text begins, and as it does, we see Enemies join forces to trap Jesus. Enemies join forces to trap Jesus. I'll explain that in a moment. Mark 12, verse 13 tells us, Later the leaders sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. The Pharisees and the supporters of Herod to see them working together was something typically that you would never see because these two groups were two groups that for the most part could not stand each other. We now, now we kind of know where, who the Pharisees were because we've seen them mentioned several times through the scriptures. They were the ritualists, they were the legalists. But who were the Herodians? Well, the Herodians are supporters of Herod were the enemies of the Pharisees. The Pharisees hated the supporters of Herod because the supporters of Herod were a politically inclined group of Jews who swore allegiance to the Roman dynasty of King Herod Antipas. The supporters of Herod believed that we should submit to Rome, submit to Herod, really for expedience sake. They were pragmatists, and they believed in going with the flow. They believed in not rocking the boat. They didn't want to get in trouble. They believed that what you need to do is go along in order to get along. And the Pharisees hated them because of that. And yet here are these two groups conspiring together. Why? Because as much as they hated one another, they hated Jesus even more, and they wanted him dead. Maybe somewhere along the way, you've heard the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and that's what you see happening here. Pharisees didn't like supporters of Herod. Supporters of Herod didn't like the Pharisees, but stronger than their disdain for one another was their desire to do away with Jesus. And in verse 14, you see them coming to Jesus with a question. And the question they ask is stated in the verse that we look at here. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You are impartial and don't play favorites. You teach the way of God truthfully. Let's pause there just for a moment. Question. Did the folks who were bringing this question to Jesus actually, in fact, believe that any of the things they had just said were true? Answer, no, of course not. Because if, in fact, they believe these things about Jesus, you could ask them, if you believe this, then why aren't you following him? They weren't following him because they didn't believe he was someone who was honest and impartial, someone who didn't play favorites, someone who taught the word of God truthfully. This is just empty flattery in an attempt to trap Jesus. And now their gotcha question, and this reminds me of, if you ever watch the Sunday morning news programs, you know, uh, Meet the Depressed or whatever, and uh, they will try to ask the guy they're interviewing a gotcha question. They'll look at an issue and say, I want to ask you yes or no, and just answer this yes or no, and inevitably the person refuses to answer it yes or no. So they ask Jesus. They say, tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Yes or no. Should we pay them or shouldn't we? Yes or no. Now, the ones asking this question 
believed that they'd come up with a perfect question with which to trap Jesus. Because the Jews in this day were living in Israel, which was an occupied nation. Another nation, a foreign nation, had conquered them. Rome had conquered them, and Rome was ruling over them. And the Jews were forced to pay taxes to Rome, and the Jews hated doing that. Now, it was nothing like our attitude here in the U.S. when it comes to paying taxes. This past Monday, April 15th, we all had the privilege of joyfully paying taxes to our nation. And I know we all did it with a glad heart. We gave thanks for the nation in which we live and all that it does for us and the privilege of being able to pay something to support it. But believe it or not, the Jews didn't feel that way about Rome. They resented having to pay their taxes to an occupying nation. And so if Jesus said, you should pay the tax, he was in danger of angering the people because all the people were mad that they had to pay this tax to a foreign nation. If on the other hand, Jesus said, don't pay the tax, he would be in danger of Rome arresting him for being a criminal, being a revolutionary like Barabbas. So these leaders believed they had set the perfect trap for Jesus. He could not say yes, he could not say no. Well, take a look at Jesus' response. And as you do, I want you to notice, regardless of the way they framed their question, regardless of the way they tried to tee it up, he does not give them a yes or no answer to their yes or no question, but instead, as he often did, he answers their question with a question. Verse 15 tells us, Jesus saw through their hypocrisy, and he said, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a Roman coin, and I'll tell you. And when they handed it to him, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Now, if you're curious about what a Roman coin in that day looked like, you can take a look at our screen because here's a picture of one. This is a picture of a denarius. And a denarius was equal to a day's wage for a Roman soldier or for a day laborer. It was a small little silver coin. On one side was an image of Caesar, a profile in this case of Caesar Tiberius, on the other side was an image of Caesar sitting on the throne with the robes of a priest. And the inscription on it said, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. So it had an image on it. Now, for those of you who know your Old Testament, what does the second of the Ten Commandments say? It says you shall make no image of anything in heaven or on earth. It doesn't just say make no image of God, but it says make no image or no likeness of anything even of a person. And the Jews took this so seriously that for them to have to use money that had an inscription, an image on it, they hated it. Number one, they hated paying taxes. And number two, they hated paying taxes with a defiled image-laden currency. So it was kind of a double offense to them. So Jesus asked them, whose picture and title are stamped on it? And they replied, Caesar's. Well, then Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And it's interesting because they commended Jesus for being someone who spoke truthfully. And if you read forward in the scriptures, you'll find out that these guys are asking the question are themselves a bunch of liars. Because what is Jesus telling them here? He's telling them to pay their taxes, to pay your taxes to the government. And when it came to the trial of Jesus just before going to the cross, what did they accuse him of? They accused him of telling the people, don't pay your taxes. Don't pay your taxes. Well, Jesus here has given them a two-part answer. He's telling them that mankind has a human obligation and mankind has a spiritual obligation. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, it's right to give taxes to the one who's collecting them. In this case, Caesar Tiberius, because the coin has his image on it, his inscription on it. Absolutely, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And we need to understand what that means for you and me. And what it means for you and me is that you and me, if we're Christians, have a dual citizenship. We are citizens not only of heaven, but we're also citizens of this earth, of this state, of this city. And what that means is God wants us to pay our taxes. Paul the Apostle said it very clearly in Romans 13. He said, everyone must submit to governing authorities. And you read that and you go, yeah, yeah. But, but why, Paul? Why? And he tells us, all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So therefore, 
anyone who rebels against authority is in fact rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. And just to make sure you don't think there's some loophole in this that would take taxes out of the equation, a couple of verses later, Paul writes, pay your taxes too for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They're serving God and what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Now, why do you suppose Paul said, pay your taxes twice? I think he said it twice because he knew we need to hear it twice. Now, I know there's some of us who are not necessarily the biggest fans of those who are in power in our government today. Maybe the people in power today are not the people you voted for. But however bad you might think those individuals are who rule over us today, I can promise you they could not hold a candle to the emperor Caesar who was in power at the time that Paul penned these words. Nevertheless, you don't see Paul writing, not my emperor, I didn't vote for that guy. No, he says, pay your taxes. Give respect and honor to those who are in authority, whether you voted for them or not. Now back to Mark 12. When Jesus gave that answer to their question about paying taxes, when he told them, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God, we are told what their reaction was to what he said. We are told that Jesus' reply completely amazed them. It was a great answer, one they couldn't argue with. And you read on a little further, further to verse 18, and you'll find that Jesus is approached by a different group of people with a different question. This one was a question about the resurrection. Verse 18 tells us, then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, by some Sadducees. Now, who were the Sadducees? Well, the same verse that introduces them here, Mark 12, 18, also answers that question who they were. We're told that the Sadducees were religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. And this was kind of the defining characteristic of them that set them apart from the Pharisees and all the other Jewish religious groups. In fact, it was such a key cornerstone of their theology that Luke, who was the writer of the book of Acts, when he's writing in Acts 23, talks about a time when the apostle Paul was on trial before the Jewish high council. And the Jewish high council was a mixed group. It was comprised of both Pharisees and Sadducees. And as Paul is standing trial, he shouts out before the high council. He shouts, brothers, I'm a Pharisee, as were my ancestors. And I'm on trial today because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. And the author Luke tells us this divided the council. Why? The Pharisees against the Sadducees. What was the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all of these. And if you went to Sunday school as a child, maybe you learned it this way in order to keep these two groups straight. What was the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The difference was the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Got it? The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, which of course is why they were sad, you see. Okay, you groan, but you'll remember it. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. There are other differences to be sure. The Pharisees were the ritualists. The Sadducees were the rationalists. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection or angels or spirits or miracles. But maybe most important, and maybe you didn't know this about them, they did not believe in the Old Testament scriptures except for the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. That's all they believed in. They believed only in the first five books of the Old Testament. They believed the ones that Moses wrote were inspired, didn't believe the others. And because they did not believe in a future resurrection, they put all their stock in the here and now. To the Sadducees, the idea of a coming resurrection was foolish, it was irrational, and so they come to Jesus with a question. And in their question, they describe a scenario which, if you think about it, sounds a little bit absurd. They introduce their question regarding the resurrection by quoting Moses, because remember, he's the only writer from the Old Testament they believe in. And they pose this question to Jesus. They said, teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, 
leaving a wife without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died without children. Then the third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them, and still there were no children. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Now, what was behind the question they were asking? What was behind the question was the teaching of Moses in Deuteronomy 25, where we read, if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Now understand, the Sadducees who brought Jesus this question were not questioning the teaching of Moses. The practice described in these verses had been something they had adhered to for centuries. What they were doing was constructing this bizarre hypothetical scenario of this one bride for seven brothers. And using the teaching of Moses as a backdrop, they asked Jesus, if there really is a resurrection, then whose wife is she going to be since she was married to all seven husbands while she was here on earth? And notice... Since they appeal to the teaching of Moses when they ask their question, Jesus will go back to the teaching of Moses when he answers their question in just a moment. But before he does, he tells them what's wrong with their reasoning. What's wrong with their reasoning? Basically, they were wrong on several counts. Number one, they didn't know the scriptures. Where do we see that? We see that in the words of Jesus in verse 24 where he says, Your mistake is you don't know the scriptures. You don't know the scriptures. And the second error they were making was that they didn't know the power of God. They didn't know the power of God. Where do we see that? Again, same verse, verse 24. Jesus said, your mistake is you don't know the power of God. And then Jesus goes on and tells them in verse 25, for when the dead rise, and stop there for just a moment and notice something. It's kind of important here. Jesus says, when the dead rise. He does not say if the dead rise. He says when they rise. There's no if about it. And then he points out a third thing that was wrong with their reasoning, and that is they assumed that heaven was going to be just like earth. And that's not that foreign of an assumption to a lot of people. They just feel like heaven is kind of earth on steroids, you know? And so I've shared with some of you before the story of baseball in heaven. These two best friends... 90 years old, Mo and Sam, two guys who've been friends all their lives. And now Sam is dying. And Mo is a best friend, Wood comes to visit Sam every day on his deathbed. And Mo says to Sam, Sam, you know how the two of us have both loved baseball all our lives and how we played minor league ball together for so many years. Sam, now that you're dying, you have to do me one favor. When you get to heaven, and I know you're going to go to heaven. When you get to heaven, somehow, you got to get word back to me and let me know if there's baseball in heaven. And Sam looks up at Mo from his deathbed and says, Mo, you've been my best friend all these years. This favor, if it's at all possible, I will do it for you. And as you'd expect, shortly after that, Sam passes on. Fast forward a couple of nights later, it's midnight, and Mo is sound asleep when he's awakened by a blinding flash of light and a loud voice that calls out to him, Mo, Mo, who is it, Mo says, sitting up suddenly, who is it? Mo, it's me, Sam. And Mo says, come on, you're not Sam, Sam just died. And he says, I'm telling you, it's me, Sam. Sam, if that's you, where are you? I'm in heaven, says Sam, and I got to tell you, I got really good news and a little bad news. Well, tell me the good news first, says Mo. The good news, says Sam, is there is baseball in heaven. And better yet, all our old buddies who've gone before us are there. And better yet, in heaven, we're all young men again. And better yet, it's always springtime and it never snows. And best of all, we can play all the baseball we want and we never, ever get tired. 
Really, says Mo, that's fantastic. That is wonderful beyond my wildest dreams. But what's the bad news? And Sam says, the bad news is you're pitching next Tuesday. <laughs> now, I share that story with you because the guys in that story just assumed that heaven couldn't be heaven unless heaven was just like earth. And so if there was no baseball there, they could not enjoy it. And in the same way, these questioners of Jesus assumed that if Moses required something to be done here on earth, one brother marrying another's widow, followed by another, and then another, and then another, those relationships had to continue on in heaven. What they missed was the reason for the command that Moses gave here on earth, which was so that the widow could raise up offspring for the deceased brother. And that reason will not be necessary in heaven, where there will be no death or dying or no need to make sure that ch children continue to be born. Again, Jesus said, For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. Pause there for a moment. Did Jesus say that when we die and when we go to heaven, we are going to be angels? No, he did not. And yet I can't tell you how many people I've met who said things like, well, when they die, I know they went to heaven and got their wings and became angels. It's a great idea, just doesn't come from scripture. It comes from a movie starring Jimmy Stewart. It's a wonderful life. And in that movie is the line, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Came from It's a Wonderful Life, doesn't come from the Bible. We don't become angels when we die. We become like the angels in this respect. We neither marry or are given in marriage. When we die, we become like the angels. We become deathless. We become immortal. We live forever. But in heaven, there's no need to procreate. Marriage is a wonderful blessing that God gives for earthly temporary companionship and also to propagate the human race, but there won't be a need for that in heaven. And Jesus concludes his answer to the question of the re resurrection in verse 26 by pointing his questioners, the Sadducees, back to the part of the Old Testament that they actually believed in. But now he says, as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses in the story of the burning bush? Hey, guys, didn't you learn this in Sunday school? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Stop right there. Remember something. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were long dead when God spoke these words to Moses. And God did not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, present tense. Jesus was asking them, don't you guys even know your Bibles enough to know that when God spoke, he spoke in the present tense? He could not say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unless they were still alive and awaiting the resurrection. That was his whole point. Jesus had a very high view of Scripture, even to the point of focusing on the difference between the verb tenses. That, that's how important it was. It's not I was, it's I am. And he concludes his words to them and to us by saying, so he is the God of the living, not the dead. You've made a serious error. Oh, I want to conclude this morning by taking us back to where we began. Ben Franklin's two certainties in life, death and taxes. And I have met some smart people who've been able to live this life for the most part, avoiding taxes, but I've yet to meet a person who was able to dodge death. And the practical application for us is physical death is certain for every single living person. Unless we happen to live on long enough to the day when Jesus returns, everybody's going to die. But it's also true that every person is an eternal being who will live on somewhere. And where that somewhere is, is something we have to settle in this life because there are no second chances. Thinking of a way to make this simple, you can think of it like this, and this is not in your notes, this one's a freebie. Everyone will either be born once and die twice 
or they'll be born twice and die once. Born once, die twice, born twice, die once. In John chapter 3, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you have done unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you've never been born again by the Spirit of God, you won't see the kingdom of God. Now, being born again, that happens by confessing your sins to Jesus, receiving his free gift of forgiveness and eternal life, and then you are being what he refers to as born by the Spirit. It's not a big mystical thing. But it is something you got to do. Jesus offers this as a free gift, and the choice is yours to accept or reject. If you accept, you're born again. If you reject, you will die spiritually. If you receive that free gift, you're going to live in heaven forever. And even though a Christian might die physically, that is not the end of the story for them. Their life continues on forever with the Lord. Would you pray with me? Let's bow together. Father, I pray for each person here with us this morning that they would know the truth of why it was that Jesus left heaven and came to earth, why he followed a path to a cross to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to bridge the gap that existed between sinful man and a holy God. He suffered a punishment he didn't deserve. He paid a debt he didn't owe so we could receive a gift we don't deserve. So we could receive forgiveness, adoption into your forever family, purpose in our lives, and a fresh start. And if there's anyone here today who's never received that gift, may they know the truth that our God loved this world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, you only ask that we believe and receive, and you'll take care of the rest. And if you want to do that this morning, it is not mystical. It is not complicated. The words don't matter. You can talk to God in the quiet of your heart. He knows your heart. And you can say to him, God, I don't pretend to understand it all. In fact, truth be told, I may have more questions than I have answers, but I want to respond to what I do know and believe, that Jesus Christ is God. He left heaven, came to earth to be a savior. And he offers forgiveness and eternal life and a fresh start, starting over again, being born again to any who will receive it. And I want to receive that today. If that's your prayer, I encourage you, don't keep that a secret. Share it with someone. Share it with us on the connection card. On the back, there's a box where you can say, today for the first time, I want to settle the issue of where I'll spend eternity by asking Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. You let us know that. We'll pray for you. We'll send you some material to help you on your journey. Father, thank you for forgiveness, for eternal life. Thank you for the reality of the resurrection that we are made to spend eternity somewhere. I pray that each person here would be choosing to spend it with you. In Jesus' name, amen.